Welcome to DIA Today, Democracy in America Today. I'm Matt Parks alongside Dave Corbin. Glad to have you with us as we explore the ideas behind today's headlines. How's life in California, Dave? Good. I mentioned last week that the kids are back to school, so you know the next thing that happens after the kids go back to school, uh, everyone in the family gets their first cold, including uh, me. Yep. So. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully this is of the 72 hour sort, but uh, anyway, a little cold, but otherwise uh, temperatures have dropped a little bit here. It's kind of a beautiful October weather in Pasadena. How about you? Yeah, we're having a great stretch of weather right now. It's 70 degrees and sunny. Kids are outside enjoying some fresh air. Nice to be able to stretch that time out. Probably going to take the air conditioners out this weekend and hope we don't tempt fate by doing that, but we're kind of in that season where you need neither heat nor AC. And so good on the budget and uh, enjoyable time to be outside. Well, last week we looked at the depths and the roots of our present political divisions and uh, more not so good news on this front this last week, Dave. Uh, A poll came out from YouGov that found 47% of Americans disagree with the claim that the election is likely to be fair and honest. And 56% said they expect to see an increase in violence as a result of the election. So we're getting closer and closer. We're less than four weeks away now, and tensions are high and expectations are low, apparently, for the peace of our country moving forward. So we're not going to continue that conversation this time, but if you missed out on the last episode, certainly go check that out in our archives. Uh, This week and the next two weeks, we're going to take a look at how Republican principles intersect with this presidential election. So we're going to focus our attention this week on Joe Biden and look at the case that's been made for Biden and the general way that he presents himself as policies and his approach to the government in light of Republican principles. And then we'll do the same for President Trump next week and look at the third possible candidate, none of the above, in the week that follows. Let's turn to the headlines. So we're going to begin with New York Times, which published its endorsement of Joe Biden this week. It was a real shock, Dave, that the New York Times endorsed Biden after no doubt a lot of weighing their options there. Nail biter. Uh, I heard the Trump administration was thinking they may have had a shot to to get that endorsement and and, uh, it just fell through the cracks right at the end there. So uh, yeah, a shocker. Yeah, they, they call him how they see him. I remember years ago reading election season columns where they were endorsing various candidates and they went from one candidate who they endorsed based upon his experience to the next one who was endorsed as a fresh face. And the only thing they had in common, as it turns out, I bet you can guess, they were both Democrats. So this is the case for Joe Biden as the newspaper of record published it earlier this week. Uh, They've given by my count at least 10 arguments in Biden's favor depending on how you group points as they made them as you go down through. We're going to focus on the first five, which kind of lay out the case for Biden based upon his agenda. And after that, it kind of gets into his record and character, things of that sort. We're going to focus on the agenda, kind of his overall governing vision, at least as it's presented by the New York Times. So here's the first point, that Joe Biden promises to be the president for all Americans. And that's a point, Dave, that you, you noted in his debate performance uh, that you lauded in his debate performance in the conclusion there. Uh, This is where the New York Times begins. Yeah, which I think is a great place to begin. I I certainly think that we want to vote for a president that that is the president of of all people and that sees all American citizens uh, as as people that he ought to lead in a way that is toward the common good. So I think that's a that's a good marker uh, for them to use. The question is, uh, is that the case uh, with Joe Biden? It certainly feels like the case, uh, you know, at times, and uh, he seems to have a sensibility or an orientation where uh, there's a, a broader message there. But whether that will be the case in reality, I think still remains to be seen a little bit. Yeah, I'd also ask him on this front, because uh, the second point, right, is that uh, they laud Biden uh, for the promise that he's delivered to restore restore the soul of America, uh, to reduce division and anger. And the question that I would have for him is, uh, as vice president and within the Obama administration from 2008 to 2016, 
why did the same uh, spirit not produce a restoration of the soul of America over the last eight to 10 years? Not to say that restoring the soul of a country is easy or can be managed by one person, but this promise of moving beyond a blue America and a red America, uh, uh, being a president for all of America and trying to think of the soul of the country as a whole, you know, why do we continue and why have we continued to move in a direction uh, that is uh, opposite uh, to this? What, what would you do differently, Joe, than what went on the previous 10 years? Yeah, you know, you think about, about 2007, 2008, all the excitement and optimism around Barack Obama was often centered on this, that he was emphasizing that he wanted to get beyond the red and the blue, the black and the white, the the various lines of division that he said we could we could transcend, and and yet that wasn't really the way it played out during his administration. And you know we've we've talked in other contexts, written in other contexts about the tendency of that administration to use straw man arguments against their opponents to not really give a fair rendering of the position of the other side. And of course, this is one of the real dangers in political office, if you're going to be president of all Americans, you're not going to agree with them all. They're not going to agree with you. How do you actually do what you're saying you're going to do in acting on behalf of all? Well, it's again, it's not by agreeing with everybody, but it's by giving a respectful hearing to the position of the other side. And when you're describing it, when you're summarizing it, when you're ultimately disagreeing with it, to do so in terms that are fair and that take into account the actual claims the other side's making rather than using straw men and caricatures and all the rest. So I think and that's one of the places where the Obama-Biden administration was weak in, in years past, and that would be a real test for a Biden administration going forward to put that aside and to give a fair rendering of, say, the conservative position when it's stridently opposed to the one that he's trying to advocate and win a majority for. Yeah, going back to an expression that we've used over and over again, a reference to anyways, Jefferson's uh, notice, right, that every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. So how that plays out, if that plays out in a Biden administration, uh, clearly, then, then, then he may be able to achieve what wasn't achieved during the two Obama administrations. All right. The third argument that the New York Times makes on behalf of Joe Biden is that he would embrace the rule of law and democratic institutions while respecting science and expertise foreign allies, and opposing systemic injustices. I just want to read a little bit from the paragraph that summarizes all these points. It says that President Biden would embrace the rule of law and restore public confidence in democratic institutions. He would return a respect for science and expertise to the government. He would stock his administration with competent, qualified, principled individuals. What do you think, Dave? Can, can the Joe Biden administration do all those things at once? In some cases, yes, but in many cases, no. Uh, when you ask the question, who rules? What is the rule of law? Uh, is it the end game of the democratic election where uh, electorate has chosen one way and experts choose another? Uh, or you know, is it just an embrace of experts uh, so that uh, they steamroll the American electorate? And I think that on a variety of different issues in between 2008 and 2016, if you turn to an expert rather than what the electorate is telling you, just how much have you embraced the rule of law? Just how much have you embraced the end outcome of democratic institutions and democratic elections? The expert tail wags the dog that's the body politic, not quite Republican government. Right. Now, the last two focus on his legislative agenda, more particularly uh, working toward universal health care, the plans for $2 trillion we spent on combating climate change, and then a more expansive vision of the role of government in addressing three immediate challenges, the pandemic, the economy, and racial unrest. Overall, the argument is Joe Biden has a vision for a big, active government. The experts have figured out what's best for us. So a president who's willing to implement those things quickly in a broad, bold, ambitious way uh, is a president that is good, a president that's more cautious or that would defer to the American people or listen to the other side uh, would be a president who we wouldn't support. So uh, there you have it. Uh, the next four to eight years have already been predetermined for the American people, whether they like it or not. So I said that the next series of arguments really all center on the character and the record 
of Joe Biden, as well as his choice of Kamala Harris as vice president. So I'm just going to be the last paragraph of the essay and then transition to the second person we want to talk about, George Will, uh, also making a case, a very different case for Joe Biden and Democratic control of Congress at two different points in the last couple of years. This is how the New York Times concludes. Mr. Biden isn't a perfect candidate and he wouldn't be a perfect president, but politics is not about perfection. It's about the art of the possible and about encouraging America to embrace its better angels. So a little Lincoln reference there in the last phrase. Uh, this is, I think, their closing argument, which brings you back to that first argument, that, that Joe Biden will bring a kind of decency to the office and will embrace the American people as a whole rather than try to divide people, which has, of course, been a, a common objection to the Trump presidency and the overall way that President Trump has approached politics. Yeah, and as you've mentioned multiple occasions, Matt, probably uh, the argument for Biden is more strongly an argument against Trump on these points than an argument that you can entrust Biden to follow through on these points. Yeah, and so that's actually probably a good transition to the case that George Will makes. George Will, the venerable columnist, conservative columnist of many, many years, very thoughtful, former political philosophy professor of all things. But, but here he is, says he's, he's going to vote for Joe Biden, which is the first time he'll have voted for a Democrat. And his line was sort of a classic George Will quip. I have nothing against Democrats, but I've never had the occasion to vote for one. <laughs> so until now, until now. So this is a, this is a, a landmark moment in the political career of George Will. And, and over the last two years, as I said, he's laid out a case against both the president and the Republican Congress that had supported him. Two years ago, he wrote a column in June of 2018 looking forward to the November election, obviously the congressional election there, where the majority of the House and Senate were hanging the balance, arguing that individuals should vote against the Republican Party. And here's, here's what he says, the second paragraph of his essay. The principle is the congressional Republican caucuses must be substantially reduced, so substantially that their remnants reduced to minorities will be stripped of the Constitution's Article I powers that they have been too invertebrate to use against the current wielder of Article II powers. So that's powers of Congress versus the powers of the president. They will then have leisure time to wonder why they worked so hard to achieve membership in a legislature whose unexercised muscles have atrophied because of people like them. And then he goes on to argue, particularly that Paul Ryan had been a disappointment as, as somebody of of character and substance in the way that he had deferred to President Trump as Speaker of the House. He says, Ryan and many other Republicans have become the president's poodles, not because James Madison's system has failed, but because today's abject careerists have failed to be worthy of it. As Madison explained in, it, in Federalist 51, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. The interest of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. Congressional Republicans, and he says, parenthetically, congressional Democrats are equally supine toward Democratic presidents, have no higher ambition than to placate this president. By leaving dormant the powers inherent in their institution, they vitiate the Constitution's vital principle, the separation of powers. And then he goes on to conclude the piece, one more paragraph before we'll reflect on all this. In today's GOP, which is the president's plaything, he is the mainstream. So to vote against his party's cowering congressional caucuses is to affirm the nation's honor while quarantining him. A Democrat-controlled Congress would be a basket of deplorables, but there would be enough Republicans to gum up the Senate's machinery, keeping the institution as peripheral as it has been under their control and asphyxiating mischief from a Democratic House. And to those who say, but the judges, the judges, the answer is Article Three institutions are not more important than those of Article One and Two combined. What do you think, Dave? Well, it's interesting that he said he's never voted for a Democrat. And I think the reason why he's never voted for a Democrat is uh, because of what a mainstream Democrat meant uh, back then and what a mainstream Republican meant uh, that uh, prompted him to vote for the mainstream Republican over the mainstream Democrat. What I think he may get wrong or underestimate in this article and in his overall endorsement of voting for Joe Biden is just what the mainstream Democratic Party has become over the last 40 or 50 years? Is it a party that you can trust uh, with a majority in the House and Senate and a Democratic presidency? 
uh, or is it a majority in a mainstream that's gone way far afield on a variety of different issues and with that power in hand uh, would not be stopped in any way from doing whatever it wanted uh, in, in, align, in alignment with its ideological bent. Yeah, now to be fair to Will, these columns are written two years apart. So he's, here he's talking about a Democratic Congress as a check on a Republican president. And now he's, of course, endorsing Biden. And the expectation is you would have a Democratic Congress as well. So, so going forward, that's, that's the situation that he's likely embracing. Um, but it's interesting that he, he makes this case on the lines of separation of powers concerns, Federalist 51 type of concerns, the tendency of Congress to simply go along with the agenda of the president whenever that president is the same party as the majority in Congress, and that the role of, of oversight simply disappears, the role of any kind of assertion of congressional prerogative, hey, if the bureaucracy will do it better for us. Totally understand. And I think we've used the Federalist 51 argument before, you know, wanting uh, those who serve in office to, to think uh, in terms of, of the office that they hold. But I just wonder if, if you have Nancy Pelosi as speaker and Chuck Schumer as uh, a majority Senate leader, are they going to be leading the Democratic charge? Uh, and is Joe Biden going to be doing whatever they want? Uh, and what degree will Joe Biden's ambition counteract their ambition? And I just don't get the sense, once again, much like the New York Times piece, that there's a lot there to trust in Joe Biden's ability to check uh, that aspect of the Democratic Party that is leading us uh, very far down a progressive road. It's interesting. Your argument, I think, is that the result of this election is likely to be a reassertion of congressional leadership, but at the expense of executive. In other words, that rather than a balance, which is what it seems like George Will is aiming for, a kind of dynamic, healthy tension between the two institutions, you have typically a Congress deferring to a president and perhaps in a Biden administration, you have a president deferring to a Congress or deferring to the progressive wing of his party, which is well represented in leadership in the Congress. With the prospect of a court too that might be packed uh, heading in the same direction uh, and, and packed f- for just that reason of wanting to head in a different direction. Uh, right. Tallied up, uh, not not uh, a favorable result, uh, I think, uh, if, if you use uh, Will's rightful standard as a standard in this case. So let's just briefly talk about his analysis of Biden in particular. So this is from a column from just about two months ago, and he opens by comparing our present situation to that where America found herself right after the resignation of Richard Nixon. And he says, moments after becoming president on August 9th, 1974, Gerald Ford said, our long national nightmare is over. Having served a quarter century in Congress, he understood that presidents are to take care that laws produced by the first branch of government are faithfully executed. So again, a a separation of powers kind of argument from Will here. The nation, 1974, was eager for a collegial respite from the gladiatorial strife that had consumed the country during urban disorders and the Watergate stew of scandals. Joe Biden's election will end National Nightmare 2.0, the nation's second domestic debacle in two generations. And he goes down to further to praise Joe Biden as somebody who understands that a complex nation cannot be governed well without the lubricating conciliations of a healthy legislative life. Um, and he goes on from there, I think to paint a, a fairly rosy picture of what a Biden presidency might be like. He says that Biden does not endorse Medicare for all, does not oppose fracking, has not endorsed packing the Supreme Court, which is still true. He has not not endorsed it, uh, at least in recent days, and has promised to tell us right after the election, just where he stands on this very important constitutional question. He cites a friend who calls Biden a relief pitcher uh, who's coming in to essentially take over, uh, mop up the game, and will bring in a broad array of people to man his administration. And the overall tone of the piece is an expectation that, that Biden will bring kind of moderation and normalcy. Yeah, I just hope that uh, it's not more like 1964 than it is 1974, uh, because if 
we have more trouble to come, more division to come than than this expectation that that Biden would be able to temper and and keep measured uh, these uh, these tensions that uh, are are tearing the country apart uh, would would not work out, would not play out the way that the will hopes them to. I, I just I think once again there's a lot of expectation here that the country is is tired of of this division and that we want a Gerald Ford type to come in and produce a piece. And I'm not sensing that that's the case. You know, when I look out, you know, over the country, people may have fatigue, but there's a lot of driving factors here that are driving things further apart uh, that might carry Joe Biden away as well. Yeah, I think you're going to have to want to establish that piece. It's not going to be that America is just going to exhale on November 4th and say, okay, good. We can put all these divisions behind us. They're ready to fight. And, and those poll numbers we talked about at the very beginning of the show are indicative of that. They're expecting the battle to continue. So if you're going to bring a peace, if you're going to establish some kind of a truce, at least, it's going to take an act of will. It's going to take some force, some assertion, some ability, especially to push back against those on your own side and to rein them in. Because the easiest thing to do is to accuse the other side of, of hypocrisy, of stirring up trouble. That, that's, that's easy. But if you're actually going to move toward peace, it's going to have to require you to be at least even-handed in that, and especially to be on the lookout for those, in Biden's case, on the left who are, who are stirring up trouble. Does he have the political strength? Does he have the personal vigor, the conviction, and all the rest to, to do that? He may have the desire. He may have the desire. And again, he has a career uh, of being somebody who's been willing to be a, a bipartisan voice of moderation and those kind of things. Not always, but, but he's had that inclination. Oftentimes, those who have spent a long time in the Senate have, have some measure of that quality. That's just part of the, the spirit of the Senate, at least historically. But is he willing to spend the political capital? Is he willing to take stands that will anger the progressives on his left. That's why I think this issue of Supreme Court packing is so important and, and so suggestive uh, that the answer to that question might be no. Because here's an issue where the vast majority of the American people will clearly support you. You say no court packing, you are not going to be in any trouble on election day. That will easily be the majority position. People will exhale on that point at least and say, good right? But let's fight about justices, but let's not fight about the number of justices. But if he says that, there will be progressives who will be very, very angry. And so the fact that he's not willing to do that, and that he's taken this absurd position, that somehow his, his view on this is not an appropriate election matter, but the kind of thing you should say after the election is over, that to me is, is troubling. Because it suggests that whatever his personal predilections are, good old Joe kind of personality, that when push comes to shove, he's not going to be willing to take those hard stands that rein in the extremists on, on the left. Yeah, that's a great point on an institutional front. And I think on a more kind of tangible policy front, I have the same fears with regard to his environmental policies and, and the Green New Deal, right. uh, because there's a lot of energy behind this new energy policy that would dramatically transform uh, American society, American business, uh, how we operate, uh, and that would uh, hurt a, a great amount to, of Americans uh, in its desire uh, to give uh, the radical left uh, what it's been lobbying for on, on, on the energy environmental front uh, for years. Great. So we've been talking about important Republican principles over the course of the show to this point, but we haven't really given a, a broad account of those principles. And we want to do that now with our required reading. And I'm going to begin with a passage from Federalist 57. This is what Madison writes. The aim of every political constitution is or ought to be first to obtain for rulers men who possess most wisdom to discern and most virtue to pursue the common good of the society. And in the next place, to take the most effectual precautions for keeping them virtuous whilst they continue to hold their public trust. So you want wisdom and virtue, 
wisdom to discern the common good and the virtue to pursue it. And then once people are in office, you have to hold them accountable so that they continue to be virtuous. So they continue to pursue the common good. Now, as they unfold this further in the essays that follow, there's really, there's a further development of this idea of virtue. And as you look in the Federalist, you find that there are two prevailing vices in political leaders. What Hamilton calls avarice and then ambition. Avarice is greed for financial gain, ambition, greed for political power, and a, a misplaced kind of greed for political power. And as they explore the idea of virtue, there's a corresponding virtue that counteracts each of those vices. So there's integrity, which is a word that pops up a number of places in the Federalist. Sometimes it's really analogous for virtue itself, but it's a faithfulness to your constitutional duty, to the common good, in the face of particularly financial temptations, where you might be able to benefit yourself or those like you. You can think about some partisan things that might relate to that as well. And then secondly, courage or fortitude. Terms are used more or less interchangeably in the Federalist to talk about not just kind of a general courage, but particularly a courage that shows itself in a willingness to do that which is unpopular on the expectation that one will ultimately be vindicated. Rather than focus on your immediate political benefit, that's, that's the bad kind of ambition we're talking about here, to have courage, uh, the courage to seek the common good despite the political consequences, at least in the short term. So these are the kinds of people that we're looking to elevate to office, we're looking to identify as we have these political campaigns, and then we're looking to have proper systems of accountability, like, of course, frequent elections that maintain these virtues and reinforce these virtues over the course of political careers. So my required reading for today and on the subject of, of Joe Biden and Republican government really boils down to two things. To, to try to get a federalist understanding as to what republicanism is and how the executive department works in with that definition of republicanism. And then secondly, to think through uh, two historical examples of democratic presidents in American history, I think who have exhibited uh, that, those character traits, uh, those virtues that you just mentioned, Matt. Uh, the first being Andrew Jackson with regard to the National Bank, and then the second being Harry Truman uh, following World War II and in the development uh, that occurs as we move toward a Cold War. So let's start with what the Federalist uh, has to say, broadly speaking, um, in laying out what a Republican government is. Federalist One, a Federalist paper written by Alexander Hamilton that introduces the themes that will be embodied uh, in these papers, suggests that one important particular that has to be discussed is how the proposed Constitution uh, is in alignment with the true principles of Republican government. So the Constitution, as is famously said, I think in Federalist 39, if it's not uh, in alignment with Republican principles, there's no argument to be made for it. This is a Republican Constitution, needs to be a Republican Constitution. But it's also a, a Constitution that is true to Republicanism, because as uh, Hamilton also mentions in Federalist One, there are many men uh, who have come to the fore in uh, a political scene here or there who have overturned the liberties of republic. Uh, they, they start their career uh, by courting the people uh, and they end by becoming tyrants. So we have to be careful uh, as to be able to distinguish as a people uh, between a true argument for Republican government uh, and one that is false and that will lead to us being uh, disempowered. So what do we have uh, to our advantage or uh, for our advantage uh, as he's writing here in, in 1787? Well, we have, and this comes in Federalist Paper 9, uh, we have the improvements that have been made in what he calls the science of politics. So reading from that Federalist 9, uh, the science of politics, uh, however, like most other sciences, has received great improvement. The efficacy of various principles is now well understood, which were either not known at all or imperfectly known to the ancients. The regular distribution of power into distinct departments, the introduction of legislative balances and checks, uh, the institution of courts composed of judges holding their offices during good behavior, 
the representation of the people in the legislature by deputies of their own election. These are wholly new discoveries or have made their principal progress toward, towards perfection in modern times. They are means and powerful means by which the excellences of Republican government may be retained and its imperfections lessened or avoided. Right. So better to be a proponent of popular government in the late 18th century than to have been one in the Middle Ages or to go back to Greek and Roman times uh, because of these uh, modern discoveries within the science of politics. But, and we've written on this, Matt, oddly enough, after Hamilton praises this new science of politics in Federalist 9, we move to Federalist 10, where uh, James Madison um, famously brings up the problem of faction and, and that it still uh, is something that is unresolved in modern times. Can you remove the causes of it or can you control its effects? And he argues in, in Federalist 10, and this will be the, the moral of Federalist 10, that the way that the union is going to be structured, the way that the federal republic is going to be structured uh, as a representative republic rather than a direct democracy, uh, as an extensive republic rather than a small republic, uh, will really um, speak uh, to uh, the problems that are often come uh, with, um, with having popular, uh, popular means of, uh, of governance. Uh, what do you make in, in general of those kind of first couple comments on republicanism and how would they begin to kind of create a portrait of the role that the executive would play within the system? Well, I think one of the things that the Federalist is working on is to give us a right account of majority rule. And you know, the historical problem, as Federalist 9 points out, has been that when you have majoritarian systems, they abuse the minority. And you get these factions that aim not at the common good, not at protecting everybody's rights, but aiming at advancing their own personal interests, aiming at advancing their particular good. And so the question is, is there any way out of this? Can you, can you solve this problem? The historical solution to this is a mixed regime. And so what that means in the case of the executive is something like a king, a constitutional executive but not one that's accountable to the people. Because if the people choose the executive and they choose the legislators, then we expect this majoritarian steamroll to roll right over the majority. This is the problem. And so again, the historical solution to this has been, can we establish some kind of stable executive, probably by giving that person a veto over the laws made by the Congress, think about the British model where you've got the parliament and the king. And in doing so, can we at least stop the majoritarian steamroller? Now, of course, the problem is that that king may have interests of his own that are contrary to the good of the majority, the minority of the, of the community overall. So the, the big problem that the Federalist is trying to solve, that the American Republic is attempting to solve, can we actually have the genuine rule of the majority and have thoroughly popular institutions. So when we're thinking about the executive, right, we're thinking about finding a person who can be chosen by the people who can yet play the proper part in making sure that the rights of all are respected rather than just that the majority's immediate desires are translated from public opinion one day to law the next. So what you're saying, Matt, here, and I know that you are a former mathematics major in college, is that the modern world doesn't offer a simple mathematical solution to the political problem or the human condition, which is majority rules count and then justice is served. It's not always the case that majority rule is right, is good, um, is for the common good, but really the, the mathematical, create, um, mathematical equation that has to be accounted for is a mathematical equation in which we take it into account the oneness uh, of some within the body politic, the fewness within it, and the manyness, and we have to find a way right, to ameliorate the tensions between the one, the few, and the many, and to harness the energies of their ambitions of the one, the few, and the many toward the common good. Right? This is an Aristotelian political project. While we have one that uh, tends toward the common good, excellent within the president, or the few do the same uh, within the Senate or within the judiciary, it's toward the common good. And where the many too also have to be taught to be tempered uh, to, to embrace the constitution and to love it. 
So a, a much more complex a political equation than a simple up and down majority vote, correct? And yet without having any of those office holders hold their positions by hereditary tenure or by some elite qualification that only some aristocratic class can reach. So this is the thing that that's Madison so proud of as he works along that it's a Republican solution to the problem of republics, that we can actually find a way to have a one, few, many, balancing those interests, resolving those tensions for the sake of all, and yet do so without elevating some artificial aristocracy to positions that they haven't earned. So moving on to Federalist 47 through 51, where Madison takes up the, uh, the question of one department assuming uh, power over the other uh, departments of government, something that George Will brought up in his piece as well, in his critique of, of President Trump. Uh, which department did Madison believe, or did many at that time believe, was the most likely right, to have a tyrannical exertion over the other? And the answer that uh, Madison gives is not the executive branch, it's not the judiciary, uh, it's the legislative branch itself, because the people are consenting to that branch, and uh, fear there was that their power over their representatives would lead the legislature to want to have power over uh, the other branches of government. And this has certainly not been the case uh, as we've moved forward in American history. We did a show a couple weeks ago on the Supreme Court showdown where uh, uh, Hamilton had argued in Federalist Paper 78 that the court would be the least dangerous branch. So we've had situations where uh, the, uh, the politics uh, of, of where people who hold these offices uh, change the very uh, nature of the office itself. They turn it into something in which the person doesn't have an interest in defending uh, the office, but in uh, propagating uh, whatever, um, whatever political uh, vision of justice uh, they believe is best. So uh, let's turn quickly then to what uh, Madison uh, and Hamilton have to say about the executive office in particular. And this would be actually Hamilton's paper when he, he writes in, in Federalist uh, 70. Uh, he suggests that what you're looking for more than anything else in an executive, what you need more than anything else in an executive is an individual uh, who is uh, energetic. So let me read from, from Federalist 70 real quickly here. There is an idea, which is not without its advocates, that a vigorous executive is inconsistent with the genius of Republican government. The enlightened well-wishers to these species of government must at least hope that the supposition is destitute of foundation, since they can never admit its truth without at the same time admitting the condemnation of their own principles. Energy in the executive is a leading character in the definition of good government. It is essential to the protection of the community against foreign attacks. It is not less essential to the steady administration of the laws, to the protection of property against those irregular and high-handed combinations which sometimes interrupt the ordinary course of justice, to the security of liberty against the enterprises and assaults of ambition, of faction, and of anarchy. The, the, the point that he's trying to make here is that if you have an individual who's serving in the executive department, they need the requisite energy, right, in order to execute that office and execute justice. If you look at the kind of energy he's talking about, he's talking about the execution of the laws, protecting the community against foreign attacks, uh, the state administration of the laws, protecting property. So these are strictly executive functions. Again, one of the challenges we have in translating this into our own day, so with the rise of the administrative state, the executive really has, has two functions. It has this traditional role of enforcing the laws and directing America's military force when we're engaged in wars abroad, protecting the nation at home, these kinds of things that are historically essential executive tasks and one that require energy dispatch, the kinds of things that a single executive is well suited for. But we also have the second part of the executive function, which is managing the bureaucracy. And the bureaucracy has taken on quasi-legislative and quasi-judicial functions. So there's a sense in which you have this concentration of power in the executive in an unhealthy way so that energy across all those dimensions of the executive office can actually be a very dangerous thing insofar as it really raises the possibility of these violations of the separation of powers that, that Madison called tyranny. So safeguards that might have been in place against the abuse of that energy by an executive in 1790 
uh, are no longer in place when uh, that president has lent over, uh, whether purposefully or not, some of his energy to that administrative state that is always running at a high level of energy, correct? Right. And I think one of the things that's important to get in the Federalist is that we don't just have three branches of government and we want to keep somebody looking over everybody else's shoulder. That is true. But we also have three branches of government because there's this distinctive executive function, legislative function, judicial function. We've talked about this before. And so what's appropriate in the executive, having a single person who's able to act with dispatch to execute the law well immediately without deliberation, without committee work and all the rest, that's great. That's what you want when it comes to enforcing the law. But that's not a good model for making the law. There's a reason why we want laws made by legislative bodies, which have numerous members where they can deliberate, where they're forced to deliberate, where they're forced to reach consensus and oftentimes compromise. That produces better law. Likewise, judges, there's a certain context that produces good judgment. And so when all these things are done by an executive branch that's been set up to do one thing well, it can't do these other tasks well and with the same measure of responsibility and effectiveness so let's turn now to the historical examples, and we'll, we'll start out with, with Andrew Jackson. So Matt, what we're arguing here is that if, if Joe Biden is to be a solid lowercase r Republican president, and we know he's a Democrat, but he's going to be a solid lowercase r Republican president, uh, and he's going to be able to kind of um, secure for us a more perfect union by carrying out this office in a Republican fashion, why is Andrew Jackson... Uh, with the case of the Second Bank of the United States in 1832. Why is he a good historical example to look to that if Joe Biden modeled his behavior after Jackson, he would do well for the Republic, he would do well for the United States? Matt? Well, it's, it's certainly not everything in Jackson's example from his dealings with the Second Bank of the United States. But as he was explaining his veto, and this is a bill that would have extended for 20 more years this bank that had been established by James Madison and the Congress when he was president. He vetoes the bill. He makes a case against it on constitutional grounds and sometimes on prudential grounds. But as he lays out his overall vision for the role of government, I think he, he hits a principle that today's Democrats would especially do well to heed. And it's not that Republicans wouldn't do well to heed it too, but, but the Democratic orientation toward thinking that a large government will be the friend of the average person really has to be challenged, I think, by historical evidence and by appreciations of human nature. What, what actually happens when you expand government power? Does it actually benefit the person on the bottom? And you can think about certain programs that might do that. And you can think about welfare state programs. Well, those checks go to people who qualify under certain criteria. But as the government grows and as the money that it spends, let's say, in encouraging industry in this area or in establishing parameters for taxes that have these loopholes or these qualifications, as all that happens, you have a tendency not to promote the interest of the many, but to promote the interests of the well-connected few. And this is how Jackson kind of summarizes that point as he works his way through his reasoning for vetoing this bank bill. He says, there's no necessary evils in government. Its evils exist only in its abuses. If it would confine itself to equal protection, and as heaven does its reigns, shower its favors alike on the high and the low, the rich and the poor, it would be an unqualified blessing. And so what, what Jackson asserted, and this was a principle that proudly followed over the course of his presidency, was that as the power of government grows, the power of those who are well-connected and close to that government grows. The power of those who have the best accountants and the best lawyers and the best lobbyists, their power grows. Not the power of the people. Even though you might intend the program that you're creating to create lots of jobs, lots of good paying, clean energy jobs or whatever the latest proposal might be, what results from that typically is not a benefit for the many, but a benefit for the few. And so to appreciate the way that those who are well-connected capture government 
resources and, and therefore to be on guard against that, even as no doubt Biden will be expanding the powers of government further, would be a lesson I think he would do well to learn. So going back to these two virtues that you mentioned before in referencing 57, part, part of being wise, I think, involves being honest. So it takes a certain honesty with regard to what the end result of your policy is. And if you take an honest look at who's grown more powerful over the course of American history, given the growth of the administrative state, you can turn to a variety of different sectors that have done very well uh, by, by that growth, correct? But it takes a certain amount of courage thereafter, in addition to honesty, to counter those interests. Well, the example I wanted to turn to on, on this, uh, you know, what it means to be a lowercase r Republican executive, that I think is also kind of a, a key virtue here. We mentioned we wanted a president that has the requisite energy, uh, but we also have to have a president who is accountable. And one of the uh, problems, right, when you shift off responsibility to agencies and to the administrative state is you can blame those agencies and that administrative state. And you can say even, well, I'm not making these other people wealthy. It's, this is a system that's in place and there's nothing I can do to fight this bureaucracy, right, Matt? So why I think Truman, Harry Truman, uh, is, is a solid example on, on this front in terms of character wise is this notion, right? You, when you remember Truman, you always remember the phrase, the buck stops here. Right. So he gives this address to the National War College in December 19th, on uh, December 19th, 1952. So he's uh, a lame duck president. And he says the following, you know, it's easy for the Monday morning quarterback to say what the coach should have done after the game is over. But when the decision is up before you and on my desk, I have a motto which says the buck stops here. The decision has to be made. Right? The president, he says later in his farewell address, whoever he is, has to decide. He can't pass the buck to anybody. No one else can do the deciding for him. That's his job. And, and that notion of, of, of having to make hard decisions, uh, hopefully making those decisions with, with discernment, uh, but making those decisions and knowing that there'll be a consequence for those decisions and having the courage uh, to make the challenging uh, decision anyway. Uh, here you have the example that you know, we often think about, the use of the atomic bomb. Uh, you also have uh, his willingness to to invite uh, Winston Churchill uh, out to um, uh, out to Missouri uh, to speak at Westminster College, uh, knowing full well uh, that uh, Churchill was probably going to see, say some things that that wrinkled American public opinion at that time, but things that needed to be said uh, with regard to uh, the status of the Soviet Union, its animosities uh, towards the Western world uh, and to the United States in particular. Uh, and I think thirdly of an example of Truman, as Buck stops here, um, uh, courage, is just his willingness to, to um, go up against uh, those elements that he thinks may be leading the country astray. Uh, whether it's someone who uh, is doing it, say in the person uh, of Harry Wallace, who was uh, one of the uh, more leftist members of his cabinet, uh, who was upset with Truman's position with regard to Soviet Union and who he asked for Wallace's resignation in late 1946, or the other famous example of, of Truman's um, uh, contentions uh, with Douglas MacArthur uh, and doing the same. Uh, Truman, in, in both of these cases, I think he was upholding uh, his office in this case, and, and he did so courageously where you know other forces may have led him to uh, embrace uh, the general or embrace uh, uh, communism and its proponents in the United States uh, instead of uh, what the power of the executive should be. That's exactly the case that Hamilton makes for the singular executive. That's why we need to have one president, not multiple presidents, nor not a, a president plus a council that you can shift responsibility to, as you were saying earlier. It's critically important that there be one person. We know who that person is. That decision is theirs. And to have somebody who accepts that, that burden uh, but also, obviously, the power that goes along with that and is willing to be held accountable on that basis, that's critically important for, for the presidency. Is Joe Biden, once again, willing to exert that authority and to do so in the face of, of critics on every side and particularly in the face of those on his left flank who are likely to want to push him? But at least for now, and, and from the first debate, right, he famously said in that first debate, I am the Democratic Party. <laughs> uh, it seems like he's trying to signal 
uh, that the buck will stop with him. But I, I, I do, like you, uh, wonder uh, whether that will be the case when we get into uh, the uh, details of, of the policies to come uh, were he president and have uh, Democratic majorities in both the House and Senate. We've seen, even over the course of the campaign, this very unusual move that he's made, not toward the center, which is the normal thing you do after running to the left or to the right in the primary. He's run to the left since the end of the primary season. And so, again, all this is suggestive of a pliability that means that the Joe Biden you think you're electing, the Joe Biden that was described by that George Will column, for example, may not be the Joe Biden presidency that you actually get. Well, with that, we will transition to the grade book. Last several weeks of the campaign, we're focusing on the most recent debate. We'll see if we have a debate next week. Seems unlikely at this point. In the meantime, we have a vice presidential debate to talk about. So let's get right to it. Dave, what would you grade Kamala Harris's performance in the debate on Wednesday night? One of the things that I worried about is how much she would grate uh, on people, uh, how uh, condescending she would be. I, you know, there were moments there where she defined what uh, debt was and what a bounty was, which was nice. She was like the Webster's Dictionary for the American people uh, that was all condescension. You know, other moments where she tempered that to some degree. I, I think I'd give her uh, probably about a C, C minus uh, when everything was said and done. She uh, looked comfortable. Uh, she had done her homework uh, and she was kind of a, a mixture of, of uh, condescension and uh, likability. I'm going to give her a C plus. I thought she was too scripted. You know, it's not good when the moderator tells you you've already made a point 30 minutes ago. <laughs> it's time to move on. You start go, rattling off the same talking points. Uh, I thought it was way too clever by half the way she tried to respond to the court packing thing by talking about how President Trump's nominees weren't diverse or how many there had been or, you know, sort of using the term in a different sense than everybody knows it's meant to be used. And I think there were some points, especially where she seemed like she was kind of playing to the progressives in the way that she would reference either things that President Trump had done or various events, the way that the progressive Twitter sphere understands those things that probably didn't really help the ticket or play well with the general audience. There was no disaster. It didn't really hurt the Biden campaign except for extending this debate over court packing. And that was really Joe Biden's fault more than hers because he'd set the tone the previous debate. When you're leading in the polls and you seem to be on a path toward victory, she didn't undercut that in any way. But I don't think she did anything especially helpful for the campaign either. Yeah, there was nothing there that I thought would put Biden in a better position to win Pennsylvania, North Carolina, or Florida. Right. Now, how about Mike Pence? Well, I wondered if he had a pulse at the beginning, and that <laughs> scared me a little bit. So uh, I just wanted to make sure Very he was mellow. there. Very mellow, yeah. Very mellow. Uh, so I, I, I thought he started out uh, very slow, I, uh, lacking a pulse, but I think as the debate went on, uh, he moved. Um, he moved to about an A minus. I, I, I guess he moved to an A. Uh, I would say, but I wouldn't give him an A for a final grade because of his slow start. So probably an A minus. Uh, he was he was steady. Uh, he had done uh, his homework. Uh, people may complain that he went over his two minute allotted time, uh, but better to go over your two minute allotted time than to interrupt the other person uh, every second that you have, a, every opportunity that you have a chance. Uh, I think that uh, he finished his points and that he was on point and that his points were uh, particular uh, for those states, those parts of the country uh, and those, uh, those, that part of the demographic that uh, Trump uh, needs uh, to, to win. Uh, I think if I was a suburban mom, uh, I, I would look at Mike Pence's performance and, and say he's a trustworthy uh, person uh, who's advocating a trustworthy cause. If I'm in Pennsylvania and I see his emphasis on fracking, uh, I like that. His defense of Amy Coney Barrett, I like that. Uh, uh, his clear uh, notion that he's proudly pro-life and, and what that means. Uh, all good, 
uh, a critique, uh, but that, that lacked the harshness. So um, I, I thought he did a, a really masterful job when everything was, was said and done. But what troubled me is that I you know, looked at the coverage of it thereafter, and you would have thought that he was a, a D plus because a black fly was on his head for two minutes. So that's kind of where we are. Yes, our great attention span. It's funny, I didn't even notice the fly. You know, you, you were texting me as we were watching the debate and you made a reference to the fly. And I thought there was some kind of weird autocorrect thing because <laughs> we'd heard a weird sound, but we, I, hadn't, I hadn't even noticed it. We have a small TV in our bedroom and we're kind of sitting back a little bit. So somehow that, that eluded me. And meanwhile, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting your text and there's all these things that are buzzing around in the, in the coverage of it about this fly. And of course I, I see it later, but so yeah, you're Matt's family here and you're thinking of a Christmas present for the Parks family. There are flat screen TVs at Best Buy that are over 47 inches for about 200 bucks right now. So just, just a gift idea for A little, for, little for higher resolution TV yes. for the bedroom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it seemed like hard to believe that we could have missed the fly, but, but I, I honestly did miss the fly. Yeah, I, I thought Pence's performance was, was very good. I, I'd probably give him a B plus. In some ways, I think the second half was weaker than the first, not because the, the kind of energy as you were talking about, but some of the techniques he was using, they just seemed overly repetitive by the end. So I appreciated his willingness to finish his point, to not be cowed by moderators, to end just exactly when two minutes is up. But if you do that every single time, uh, it, it begins to get a little bit wearisome. I thought also the way that he would almost never address even the topic of the question until he was about a minute and a half in because he was always responding to the last thing. Again, that, that, that's good. You know, you don't want to let an attack go unanswered, but to do that every time. And then of course, because of that, have to go over. And it, it just seemed like some of the things that he was doing to kind of manage the debate were more effective in small doses than they were in, in large doses and by the end, it, it felt like a little bit too much preparation, too much of a game plan being executed, maybe a little bit too well. I thought that on abortion, I, was, I, was, I certainly appreciated that he was forthrightly pro-life. I would have been happy if he'd answered the question, would you be in favor of a ban on abortion in Indiana? He kind of got to abortion eventually in that, never answered that directly. If you're forthrightly pro-life, you can go ahead and say you'd be in favor of a ban on abortion in Indiana. He did a good job riding the ship. Certainly made a more persuasive case for the Trump administration than President Trump uh, did. Certainly has nothing to be ashamed of and did his best, I think, to try to put the administration on a positive trajectory. Probably something that uh, for 2024 for, for Pence uh, was a, a great display uh, of, of his bona fides that uh, he he could very well uh, put himself in a good position. Not that that was the objective uh, of the of the debate, but I think uh, he will be a front runner uh, in 2024 because of uh, his performance. Right. So now we're going to turn to De Tocqueville's crystal ball. We have four rounds of sports picks in the books. We had a pretty good week for both of us last time around. Uh, you were three and two. I was also three and two. So you are now seven and thirteen. I am fourteen and six. Round five, we start in the NFL, Dave. Indianapolis Colts at the Cleveland Browns. Both teams off to a good start. Probably the Browns more of the surprise of the two. Colts are favored by two points. What do you think? I'd take the, the Colts here. Yeah, no, no, no uh, question about it. Uh, the Browns' schedule has been weak up until this point. So I, I think their three wins uh, are a little deceiving. I take the Colts, even giving away two points. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm going to take the Colts here as well. I think the Colts... Running game is very strong and looks like their defense is holding up well. Cleveland's a little banged up. So I think the Colts probably win this by, by at least a touchdown is what I would expect. All right, college football, our second pick. Number seven, Miami at number one, Clemson. Just shows you how much Clemson is regarded and has been on top for these last several years. 14-point favorite over the number seven team in the latest polls? Well, Miami could score. I just think that Clemson can score more. And I, I have this feeling that Clemson, uh, thinking that, uh, uh, or looking at Miami that thinks it's maybe more than it is, will want to teach them a lesson. So I'm going to say Clemson uh, with the spread, giving away 14 points. Okay. Well, I agree with you on that one too. So I think Clemson 
can put up the points. They haven't really had to yet this season, but I think if they get challenged, that might be a good thing for them. And we'll see just how much firepower Trevor Lawrence and the rest are able to bring to bear against that Miami defense. Number three, NBA Finals Game 5. This could be it tonight. Miami at the Lakers in the bubble. Think about how long they've been in that bubble. It's amazing to think about. This is finally the end. Uh, it could be all over tonight. Lakers are a seven-and-a-half point favorite. LeBron going for his fourth championship in 10 trips to the finals. And they're wearing the Black Mamba uniforms in memory of Kobe Bryant tonight. Lakers finish the job, Dave? Yeah, I think they do. I, I just wonder how much energy Miami had, has left. Um, great game, uh, three uh, for Miami. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Jimmy Butler can only carry the team uh, so much. And, and uh, so, I, yeah, I say the Lakers take it tonight, uh, unfortunately. There's no team other than perhaps the Yankees that I dislike more than the <laughs> Lakers. I agree with you on that. Yeah, it's, I would be glad to have the Lakers lose. I don't think it's going to happen. I think they will cover the seven and a half points. I think LeBron gets to celebrate the black Mamba uniforms, carry the day. Number four, we have, speaking of the Yankees, AL division series game five. I'm going to start not much more than an hour from when we're recording this Yankees at Tampa Bay Rays. We've got Garrett Cole pitching on three days rest for the first time in his career against Tyler Glasnow pitching on two days rest for the first time in his career. Probably both bullpens will be involved relatively early, but two great starting pitchers at least to get this game started. What do you think, Dave? Can the Yankees finish the comeback? Or does Tampa Bay move on in pursuit of a second Tampa Bay championship this year? Well, I know how much you don't like the Yankees, and, and we've agreed with three picks thus far. So I'm going to take the Yankees. There's, <laughs> there's a reason why uh, they went out and got Garrett Cole, and I, uh, I think he pitches a good game. Uh, They hit a couple home runs early uh, and uh, are able to secure uh, their their spot in the AL championship. I am very fearful that you'll be right, but I am going to take Tampa Bay. I'm kind of looking forward to the way things will go on New York sports radio if their big 324 million pitcher doesn't get it done in game five against Tampa Bay. So I'm rooting for that outcome for many, many reasons. But hopefully, Tampa Bay Rays have enough. Strike the bullpen, get a few home runs. Not a lot of offense from Tampa Bay this offseason, but maybe just enough to get over the line. All right, lastly, we've been watching this closely as we were getting ready for the show, even starting the show. We wanted our last pick to be the French Open final, but we didn't know who was going to be in it until just a few moments ago. Uh, Novak Djokovic has managed in five sets to make it to the final against, of course, Rafael Nadal. It's amazing. Djokovic going for his 18th Grand Slam championship, including one French Open. Nadal would be going for his 20th, which would tie the Federer record of 20. And of course, that includes 12 French Opens. Can Nadal keep it going, or does Djokovic get his second French Open? Here, I think we kind of need a spread just because (laughs) Nadal. So, see, often I think we should change it to. You know, does sets. can yeah, just sets. Can 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 Djokovic, you know, take it to uh, a a fourth or a fifth set? Okay, uh, all right. I, I think it's a, a kind of a fairer bet. And uh, you you okay with that? I'll 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 accept that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yes, I think he can take it to a fourth or fifth set. But Nadal is just you know, he, if if Djokovic pulls this off after what happened at the U.S. Open, uh, <laughs> it would be it would be amazing. I love Joker. I know that many people don't. Uh, I, but if, if this is a great, that would be great. We need a great uh, a tennis match, and these two are the best, you know, with Federer. So, uh, yeah, uh, well, I'll take uh, Djokovic uh, taking it to four or five sets. All right. Well, I'm going to have to agree with you on that. I, I want to say Nadal in three, but I, I don't think that'll happen. I think Djokovic will probably, with his serve, be able to push at least one set into a tiebreaker, win the tiebreak, um, but it's just hard to imagine Nadal not ultimately – taking this he's just so dominant on clay well that's it for this week's show thank you all for listening once again we encourage you as always to remember to subscribe and review the show on apple podcasts google play spotify and stitcher and we look forward to being back with you next week